USA. Do you know about the government? Can you tell me about the Constitution? Hey, learn about the USA. I'm told our founding fathers did agree to write a list of principles for keeping people free. The USA was just starting out a whole brand new country, and so our people spelled it out the things that we should be. And they put those principles down on paper and called it the Constitution. And it's been helping us run our country ever since then. The first part of the Constitution is called the preamble and tells what those founding fathers set out to do. We the people, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare and Secure the blessings of liberty To ourselves and our posterity Do ordain and establish this constitution For the United States of America In 1787 I'm told our founding fathers all sat down And wrote a list of principles that Known the world around The USA was just starting out A whole brand new country And so our people spelled it out They wanted a land of liberty And the preamble goes like this We the people In order to form a more perfect union Establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility. Provide for the common defense. Promote the general welfare and secure the blessings of liberty. To ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this constitution for the Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for spending a little bit of time out of your undoubtedly busy schedules, especially on a Friday, for us to not only commemorate and celebrate the founding of our guiding legal document, the United States Constitution, but to have a little bit more of a deeper conversation and reflect upon this in perhaps some different ways, especially when it comes to the role that the reformation of our our own law and order during the colonial era that the United States Constitution represents, but also doing what we can to understand the reverence that this document has and continues to hold, the role that it continues to play in our daily lives, and the overall makeup and our own social, cultural, and political constitution. So welcome, everybody. I am Dr. Stacy Rykowski, the Assistant Professor of History for New River Community and Technical College. Incidentally, also teach a little bit of uh, geography and American government as well. So again, thank you for joining us for what we're gonna be talking about today, a look back at the role, the evolution, and even the reverence that has captured our imagination with this founding document, continues to guide our actions, and has even become the nucleus of our sense and sensibility about law in order in the United States. Now, that being said, we are introduced with this video that makes us feel very uh, happy, makes us feel very reverent and celebratory, right? Especially when it comes to our experience in modern day with the Constitution. But I'd like for us to take a look back and consider some of the dubious beginnings that this was far from certain that we are benefiting from that hindsight, right? Hashtag spoiler alert, you know how this turns out, but it was far less clear 
and far less certain in the moment of its creation. So we're going to explore some of those different ideas in our short time together today. So we had a little blast from the past from Schoolhouse Rocks. As you can see, my virtual background welcomes you to the Hall of the Constitution, uh, situated in none other than Washington, D.C. in the United States. And for those of you who have perhaps been lucky enough to visit the Hall of the Constitution or even Constitution Hall in Philadelphia where the Constitution was originally developed and promoted, you'll remember this sense, right? This almost kind of somber, poignant, uh, very quiet ease and due, due in large part to the deference and the respect that is played and paid towards the Constitution now. But in the moment, it again was not quite embraced the same way that we embrace it now. So I invite you to come with me on this journey as we talk of, about a few more of those details. And as always, if you know me, and even if you don't, I love answering questions. I'm very passionate about the Constitution and sharing uh, some of my thoughts. And so I always invite questions, um, any other comments that you would like to commit. But because we have such a short time together, we'll get to those at the end of our uh, talk today. So feel free to go ahead as we go along and submit those in the question and answer uh, box, and I will be happy to talk more about those when we get things wrapped up. So thank you to everybody for joining us. I'm going to share my screen. I've prepared a little bit of a PowerPoint presentation to guide our activities today and some of the things that we're thinking about. So I will certainly, again, invite questions along the way and be happy to get to them by the end of our discussion. All right, so as I had mentioned in my opening monologue there, I frame this in this idea of looking at the reformation and reverence when it comes to the evolution and the enduring legacy of the Constitution in the United States, because in many ways I stress this um, always when I talk about the Constitution that this is not a passive document right that it demands action and so therefore in many ways, it is living it is continuing to evolve and is able to respond to many of our changing times. So we're going to take a look back and see where these roots of the reverence and the role that this reformation has been playing throughout the history of the United States in the 232 years since it was ratified. But as I mentioned at the beginning, this was a rather dubious start that this was tried, that this was untested, and many of the elements were uncertain in the moment. Because we see in the short course of just a little over a decade, we go from 1776 with the Declaration of Independence from language that begins uh, in, the, in the manner of all men are created equal to this far more encompassing and wide reaching scope of we the people of the United States. So in that moment of creation it has already been transformative and clearly opens the door for ongoing evolution and change. But again, this was a rather auspicious beginning. Those who had committed to the revision of the form uh, of the former uh, seat of government, which were the Articles of Confederation following the conclusion of the American Revolution, were very uncertain. They'd originally been hired or commissioned to revise those Articles of Confederation. And then yet we end up with a relatively new government altogether. So there were a lot of questions surrounding the beginnings of this, that even that second constitutional convention, the Philadelphia Convention, actually had very poor attendance. There were those by the likes of Benjamin Franklin, of course, and James Madison, who were some of the big promoters of this. But other folks and these revolutionary heroes like Patrick Henry, right? Give me liberty or give me death. He said he smelled a rat. And actually refused to go and represent, uh, his, uh, represent the colonies from his vantage point. So poorly attended, it was actually conducted in secret. They met in the uh, Constitution Hall in Philadelphia, 
nailed the doors and windows shut. And so a lot of people were observing this from the outside saying, what are these people doing in there? And it really invoked many questions of the past. Now, those who were in attendance and decided to conduct this in secret said that they were doing this so that everybody would be free to explore all of these different alternatives and really be able to engage in a healthy debate for fear without fear of political consequence. So much of this was really these folks thinking on their feet. It's improvise and compromise is what is happening in that secret hall in Philadelphia. And it's also worth noting that in many ways too, Benjamin Franklin and even John Rutledge were talking with the Iroquois, the uh, Native American tribal community, the Iroquois Confederacy, for nods. And so now more and more attention is even being paid to the large role that the Iroquois Confederacy had in shaping the United States com uh, Constitution. So we see this again as a product of improvise and compromise. And even worth noting in that moment that much of what we credit as the strength of our Constitution are those first 10 amendments, right? The Bill of Rights. But in the original draft, in the original proposition for ratification, there is no Bill of Rights. And in fact, even James Madison said, I'm not sure why we really need to articulate this. But yeah, I'll think about going ahead and adding that. But let's talk ratification first. So once this has been crafted and once this document emerges from the Philadelphia Convention, someone had asked none other than Benjamin Franklin, uh, what's going on in there? What, uh, what, what do we have here? He said, this is not necessarily the best government de devised, but it's the best government that the people would receive. So right there, we're already kind of uncertain about the role that this document is going to play and certainly the role uh, that it continues to play in shaping and reshaping the nation throughout the next 232 years to come. So again, we see this as not a passive document, not a list of mandates, but rather a living document that is the product of these debates and compromise. And we see in many ways that it's not a single or unified political ideology. And yet, despite the fact that this is not simply a list of mandates and laws and do's and don'ts, it does carefully list the powers of the government. And it instills a democracy with checks and balances, with limits and checks so that not one branch can supersede or overcome the other. Now, yes, there are certain, uh, there's been some pushback about that, and that's perhaps a different conversation for a different day, but in the moment and even over the course of time, we do often uh, continue to witness those checks and balances uh, that do continue to function and maintain the longest surviving written charter of a government. And much of the complication comes in with the elastic language that is invoked and encapsulated in the Constitution. It creates these flexible interpretations and allows for reinterpretations. And so we do continue to see, again, this living document in action and being an actionable document, right? When people see a need for change, they see a need to test it, they are able to take action with this document. Document. And so just some of those examples of this elastic and interpretable language and certainly interpreted in different ways are phrases like providing for the common defense, the general welfare, and even what is necessary and proper, right? That these things all sound fantastic, but I can uh, nearly guarantee that all of us would have a different interpretation of what those mean and how they can be applied. And so in the end, despite some of this murkiness when it comes to how to absolutely interpret and apply the language of the Constitution, freedom and liberty to revise it, to reinterpret it, and evolve are really at the core of this document. 
So in some ways, some argue, and certainly constitutional scholars uh, will say that this is merely uh, a perfect equation, at least if nothing else, it's very elegantly balanced. But I put a question mark on the end of that again. Here we are 232 years later. Uh, we have that hindsight. We know that it's pretty well functioning. But in the moment, again, going back to Benjamin Franklin, someone had once asked him, they said, well, sir, what do we have when walking out with that constitution? And Benjamin Franklin said, we have a republic if you can keep it. So again, really lending into this air of a living document. We'll talk about in just a few more moments. Uh, my, my, one of my favorite uh, metaphors is that this is not a crock pot or perhaps now in, uh, in, our, in our modern, most modern days, not an Instapot, right? Or an air fryer. We don't get to just set it and forget it. And so Benjamin Franklin is very keenly aware of just how fragile this is. And especially when it came to the process of ratification, just because they have this document, again, hashtag spoiler alert, we know it's a, a pretty good thing. In that moment, again, the Patrick Henrys of the world were far less certain and way more suspicious about what is developing here. So ratification, actually putting this constitution, putting those words and those guarantees into action was going to be an uphill battle to say the least. So they debate and they produce this document after about a year. So that begins in 1787. But now they have to get at least a majority of the states, these former 13 colonies, to sign on, to ratify it. And you can even see from that map there on the right, some of these pretty notable divisions and perhaps even a surprising division, one that we're most familiar with in American history is that north-south sectional divide. But when it came to the Constitution, you can see what's pretty notably an east-west divide of those who were favoring ratification and those who were against it. And it appears just at least by geographical terms, more folks were certainly against it. So this creates an intense and contentious process that is clearly not widely supported or very popular. In fact, even what were considered the big states that had lots of political influence and very strong economies like Virginia, Massachusetts, and New York were very much against it. They felt as though they may be giving up too much of their power to sign on to this. It was gonna take quite a bit of convincing and there were quite a bit of influence against it coming out of these major political and economic centers like Virginia, Massachusetts and New York. So they begin holding these ratifying conventions. And in fact, so much so were North Carolina and Rhode Island against this idea of ratification. They refused to even call their own conventions. So not just similar at the eve of the Civil War when uh, certain states would not even put Abraham Lincoln uh, on the ballot, we see this as a political maneuver to push back against this major motion to ratify this constitution and put it into effect. So we see in that moment and perhaps even over the course of time that this does have a polarizing effect that many are saying that in this time, we're really only seeing states united, kind of this loose affiliation, and not officially united states. So at the time, the outlook was really bleak, even though they still needed, uh, only needed a majority and not unanimity, there's still some issues with getting this pushed through. So we see John Jay. Alexander Hamilton and even James Madison go out on a proactive publishing campaign as an argument and as the influencers to justify ratification and get more and more people on board. So we see the Federalist Papers really proliferate up and down the eastern seaboard and really begin convincing more and more folks and more and more state governments to consider joining on. So it's a slow process at first, but once a few once a few of the states begin ratifying, we ultimately see New Hampshire 
uh, provided that decisive ninth vote to secure ratification in 1788. And yet, just like with the Declaration of Independence, all of the colonies that had attended uh, the formation and uh, the declaration against King George uh, for independence, they said, we're not going to submit this unless we are unanimous. And so this is another moment at which, too, they said, yes, we do need to have unanimity. We do not want to move forward. This is already fragile enough as it is. So let's be sure everybody is on board. And that is what will officially unite these states. So despite the fact that it had already gone through for ratification, there was a push to officially unite all states. Of course, took some more convincing, took quite a bit more campaigning. But again, hashtag spoiler alert, we know that the rest is, as they say, history. So really representing this power of precedence, of being able to think on your feet, but then also make this attempt to fully unite and not uh, ultimately walk away with any lasting divisions. So we see this power of precedence to officially unite all of these states. And then later on, we see at the end of George Washington's uh, term as president, him continue to re-up these powerful precedents by willingly giving a power and encouraging uh, new leadership to come into place. So we see very early on this power of precedence that becomes very influential. So this is where we see the moment at which this becomes uh, this growing idea that not only uh, is this by the people and for the people, but that it only works because of the consent of the people, the consent of the governed. So once it gets into effect, we see it beginning to really take on a life of its own in 1789. And a big part of the ratification was that ultimate guarantee of the Bill of Rights that James Madison said, okay, sure, I'll go back, I'll go ahead and, and add these amendments to it, and we'll be able to continue moving forward. So it was that guarantee that James Madison puts in there, which as we know, he does own up to, that he does create that, that really carries the day. So as we take a moment to step back, we see where it's the culmination of plans to embody evolving and conflicting notions of government and society, right? It's that flexible language that can become, or that can create some of these sticky situations sometimes but it has enough flexibility to allow for this openness of debate to continue to address and overcome these trials and tribulations. And in fact, even James Madison, the primary author of the United States Constitution, anticipated that diversity of opinion was an unavoidable reality, but even underscored that it was the hidden strength of this new society that, yeah, we're going to disagree, but that is what's going to keep the conversation moving forward and keeping the power from condensing into the hands of a small group of just a few people. So that that's actually the hidden strength of this new society. But again, another hashtag spoiler alert, political differences clearly still remain, but we are still free to debate those and work actively in promotion of these different views. And so it is these competing, uh, these competing visions of leadership, diversity, and democracy that continue to breathe life into this constitution. And ultimately, that agreement and that respect for popular sovereignty, that is the consent of the governed, and the majority rule does endure leading by example. And of course, it's the consent of the governed, those who are in the driver's seat. And again, in the end, the reverence for the offices, if not the officers, those who are currently occupying, so we know that is one of the beauties and the challenges of the Constitution is that there is an ongoing evolution and rotation of different ideas and we're constantly seeing different voices emerging to the forefront. And so in the end, we see where there is this affirmation of a governed allegiance or of, of an allegiance to a self-governing, but increasingly diverse Republican nation. 
So that's where we continue to find ourselves as well, that we are still part of that story, this increasingly diverse uh, Republican nation, but we've got that constitution to be uh, that center point, that center constant for all of us to look back upon. And so we see the ways in which it is able to withstand the test of time. And so some of those roots of the reverence we see for the constitution and what it meant to the people then. In that moment, it was representative of evolution and empowerment. And more important, perhaps just as important is this definition of the people that we see that becoming one of the first tools that those who had been on the margins and, the, and not within the mainstream, finding that on-ramp, that this broader definition going from all men are created equal to we the people. So we still see even now it represents an indispensable tool of liberty and freedom. But as I said earlier, the metaphor that I often make is it's not self-enforcing or self-correcting, that this isn't a crockpot or an instapot. We don't just get to set it and forget it, that it is. It's living, it's actionable. And so it's points at which the direction is up to the people. And that's a big responsibility. But we still see it's the consensus of acceptance and this respect, this reverence that are central to our sensibility and really give the gravitas, the power to that document that it needs to function. And so the preservation of this does require collective and continued vigilance because it is, that's part of the, the evolutionary nature of this. It's always being tried and tested as our society changes, as our politics change. So too is the constitution continuing to change in response to much of this and vice versa. It's definitely a two-way street. We see the ways in which it allows for the pushing uh, to new heights. And always most notable that, yes, this was a groundbreaking document, that this really changed uh, the course of world civilization uh, in no small order, but that it didn't actually shatter a glass ceiling, but rather provided that foundation, that floor upon which to continue building new ideas and responding to the changes in our time and in, uh, in humanity as well. And so we take a moment to step back and again, continue to see the way that this document has become so revered and continues to withstand the test of time. So just a few reminders of this living document in action. So just a few quotes for those of you who know me and even those of you who don't, I do love the cliche of a good quote. So we see some familiar language. Democracy is the government of the people, by the people, and for the people. So we know that this comes from none other than Abraham Lincoln, again, really underscoring uh, just how long and withstanding and how powerful this document really is because it is the people, the consent of the governed that drive its power and help breathe, breathe life into it. And then another quote that uh, is worth remembering, too many people expect wonders from democracy when the most wonderful thing of all is just having it. And again, consent of the governed provides for that. So that's Walter Winchell. And then one of uh, my favorite quotes from someone we've invoked already a couple of times today, the constitution only gives people the right to pursue happiness. You have to catch it yourself. So none other than the sage advice from Benjamin Franklin. So things to th continue thinking about, and these conversations will continue to evolve and change in response to the evolutionary nature and the changing times in which we continue to live.
So not only is it a living document, but it can live in your pocket too. So for anybody in attendance, anybody uh, watching on Facebook uh, Live, if you would like for this living document to live in your own pocket, please contact Ms. Uh, Tamara Rahal for your free copy today. So there is her email information and then her phone number contact information as well. But this too can belong in your pocket. Um, I have multiple copies as well, so it's really worthwhile to have nearby. So please don't hesitate to contact uh, Tamara as uh, we move forward. So thank you, everybody. I am going to stop sharing my screen so that we've got uh, a, a view here. And I see that I've got one question. And so if anybody else would like to submit any quest chat, uh, feel free. I see we've got one here from uh, Miss Grace King, uh, Miss Grace King, where she says, "Would the Constitution considered to be the beginning of the government regulations of creating national and state laws?" Yes, absolutely. That is a fantastic question. And yes, in many ways, uh, the Constitution is this foundational document, right, for our law and order. It helps us organize, it helps us understand how to respond to different situations, but also provides, again, that flexibility for not only the creation of a federal government, but a federal government that works in concert with the state government. So still reserving a lot of uh, power for the state. And as we know, certainly creates some moments of conflict, uh, without a doubt, when it comes to some of those disagreements. And even in our time now, we're seeing that continually be tested, and they go to the Constitution to look for many of those answers and ways to continue interpreting that. So yes, absolutely, and specifically when it comes to uh, those first 10 amendments, right? Be sure to check out Amendment number 10 when it comes to uh, more, I, I, I don't want to say fully defining the relationship between the states and the federal government, but does uh, take it a step further to provide uh, for a stronger definition of what the role of the uh, federal government is versus the role of the state government and what happens if those two come into conflict. So yes, very good. It absolutely considered the uh, beginning of government regulations or the creation of our federal government. And so again, in that moment, you can see where those who were against the constitution, also known as the anti-federalists, were very suspicious of the creation of something like the federal government for fear that it would simply be a reinstatement of the monarch or the tyranny of the king from which they had just broken away from. So yes, and then I see a question from Rachel. Do you feel that uh, during the events leading to the Civil War that they refer back to the Constitution? Yep, Section 10 in regards to the, uh, in regards to the Confederate States. Oh, absolutely, that this is you know, kind of that, that two-part thing. Um, and for those of you who may be more familiar with history, especially when it came to the nullification crisis during Andrew Jackson's tenure of office, this had to do actually with a conflict of his own vice president, uh, John C. Calhoun, who represented South Carolina and said that these federal taxes they felt as though South Carolina did not have to pay those taxes because they were uh, being unfairly charged or um, unduly uh, uh, put upon for these taxes. So uh, Andrew Jackson ultimately said, yeah, no, you don't get to decide this, that this is a level at which the federal government puts these mandates. So then on the eve of the Civil War, uh, turnabout becomes somewhat fair play, right? When the Confederacy says, yeah, we have the right to secede. And then Abraham Lincoln actually goes back to that decision in the nullification crisis with Andrew Jackson and John C. Calhoun to say, no, you cannot, that this is not your right to secede. And especially again, those, those moments of the Constitution being tried and tested, especially when it came to the political power and that political balance 
that was at stake. So yeah, absolutely. And that was not only referenced, of course, in the events leading up to the Civil War, used throughout the Civil War, especially when it came to the position of the Union and Abraham Lincoln of what he was able to do in terms of responding to the secession movements of the Southern states. But of course, even now, a time at which we are living where this is continually being tested and we're seeing some changes at the state level that are arguably conflicting with the federal government. So we're continuing to see the ways in which those checks and balances are indeed checked and balanced in our own time. So yes, very good. Excellent. All right, are there any other questions, comments, anything else? Once we depart, then uh, uh, Miss Tori will hit the switch and we will be all done. All right, I'll give it just a couple more seconds. So otherwise, speak now or forever hold your peace, at least till next time or until our paths cross again. So well, again, thank you to everybody who was able to share some time with us today. And as always, even now, please do not uh, forget, I am always open and available and clearly your number one nerd uh, in the area to talk about these. So feel free to contact me even outside. I'm always happy to discuss this and anything else. So thank you guys so much. I really appreciate it. And I will definitely look forward to seeing and talking with everybody more about this and uh, certainly continuing this conversation and checking in as this continues to be a, a, an evolving and very much a lived experience in the shadow of this living document. So thank you, everybody. Have a great rest of your day and wonderful weekend. I'll look forward to talking uh, with everybody sooner, paths crossing again. Thank you.